As a schoolboy, I developed a strong fascination for William Blake. The reason was simple. William Blake never went to school. William Blake never went to school. I had to go to school. And I hated school. I admired William Blake passionately because he never ever went to school. He was taught at home by his mother to begin with and later he taught himself. This does not mean that he developed into an ignoramus. Far from it. He was very knowledgeable, very learned, very informed, especially in certain areas like art, art history, the Bible, religion, literature, history, international affairs. I also desired to remain at home and develop into a very learned man like William Blake. Instead, I went to school and developed into the ignoramus that I have now become. The contemporaries of William Blake thought that he was mad. The truth was that they were mad. Blake lived life on his own terms. Blake lived in his own reality. He was very sure of himself. And the fact that most of the people around him could not comprehend him and his ways never ever bothered him. The simple pleasures of his life, the simple pleasures of life gave him tremendous joy. The simple pleasures that he identified for himself included engraving, printing, writing poetry, binding books, reading. It may not be out of place to reveal here that I am considered mad by many of my colleagues. We frequently speak of the five great romantic poets, Wordsworth, Coleridge, Byron, Shelley and Keats. Blake came before them and without any exaggeration I can say that everything or practically everything you find in the five great romantic poets you can find in Blake. Blake was a mystic. Blake saw mystic visions throughout his life right from childhood. Blake loved nature and wrote about nature. Blake was concerned with the oppressed and the deprived. For example, in his poem London, he speaks of the chimney sweepers, the soldiers, the harlots. Blake was concerned with the rise of capitalism. In the same poem in London, he talks of the chartering of the streets, the chartering of the Thames. Blake rejected 
the heroic couplet and experimented with verse forms. Blake sympathized deeply with the, with the ideals of the American and the French revolutions. We say that Shelley set the French Revolution to music. Blake did the same thing before Shelley, much before Shelley. We sometimes say that Romanticism is about the human being as an individual, as an individual, as a unique individual, unlike every other person. Blake was very much an individual and Blake was very much unlike most other people of his time. Blake used simple diction, everyday language. We think that this was an innovation generated by Wordsworth and Coleridge. But the fact is that before Wordsworth, before Coleridge, Blake was experimenting with simple diction and everyday language. Blake rejected the rigorous logic of neoclassical poetry and tried to create a logic beyond logic. A logic that could seem illogical on the face of it, but is a logic on a higher plane, on a plane beyond reason, on a plane beyond intelligence, on a plane beyond common sense. A logic that conveys meaning on a plane of spirituality. Blake identified himself with a common man. He never sought fame. He wanted to lead the life of the ordinary people, the poor people. He lived a life of poverty and was quite happy about it. When decades after his death, when, decades after his death, it was decided to erect a monument on his grave, his grave could not be discovered, could not be discovered. The point I am trying to make is that William Blake was a romantic before the Romantic Revival. The point I am trying to make is that William Blake is the real father of Romanticism in English poetry. At the very least, we have to concede that William Blake was a great pre-Romantic. Please take a look at the title of the poem, The Lamb. At the outset, I would like to observe that this is a typically romantic poem. Can you imagine Dryden or Pope writing a poem on the lamb? What is the lamb? The lamb is the young one of a sheep. And you must Remember that the sheep is, the lamb is, the sheep is, or the sheep was an important and integral part of the English countryside. In the days of Blake, you could not imagine a country seen without sheep, without lamb. Lamb also means the fresh of the lamb. 
cooked and eaten. Extremely tasty. When you are fond of someone, you call him or call, or call her lamb. Come and sit near me. Let me put my arm around you, lamb. Lamb can mean someone who is very simple and very innocent. My daughter is a lamb. In the stock market, the lamb is someone who is cheated, outsmarted by less naive speculators. In the Bible, the lamb stands for Jesus Christ. John the Baptist called Jesus the Lamb of God. Jesus is the Lamb because God the Father sent him, God the Son, to this world in order to be sacrificed for the sins of humanity. Thus, Jesus is indeed the Lamb of God. And for centuries, the Jews used to bring lambs to the temples in order to sacrifice them. The Lamb represents sacrifice, meekness, simplicity, truth, innocence, spirituality and above all heaven. It is about the Lamb that this poem is written. Little Lamb who made thee dost thou know who made thee? The speaker addresses the Lamb he calls the lamb the little lamb to stress the fact that it is the young one of a sheep. To emphasize the fact that it is in its infancy. To underline the fact that it is something small, something young, something innocent, something naive. Little lamb. The poet addresses the lamb. The speaker apostrophizes the lamb and asks the lamb who made the lamb. The speaker wants to know whether the lamb is aware of the lamb's own creator. Who made thee? Who created thee? Do you know who created you? In the penultimate stanza of the tiger, the speaker asks, I think it's the last line, Did he who made the lamb make thee? Did he who made the lamb make thee? It is not possible to read the lamb, the poem, the lamb, without reference to the tiger. And you can see this poem as an amplification on the question posed in the tiger, in the penultimate stanza of the tiger, did he who made the lamb make thee? William Blake was a gifted mystic who deeply pondered over the mystery of existence, the mystery of life, the mystery of nature, the mystery of this universe. What we see around us is beyond all logic. Did he who made the lamb make thee? As a Christian, as an ardent devotee of Jesus Christ, William Blake believed that 
God is the undoubted creator of the universe. This being so, God created the tiger. The same God, it appears, also created a lamb. That is a difficult question. How come the God who created the lamb also create the tiger? It is not a question which can be easily answered. It, can, it is not a question which can be answered definitely, in definite terms at all. It's a question posed by Blake in the tiger. And this poem the, can be seen as an attempt to work out an amplification on that question. At the very opening of the lamp, the poet asks, the speaker asks, who created the lamb? The speaker wants to know whether the lamb knows who the lamb's creator is. Gave thee life and bid thee feed by the stream and over the mead. Mead means meadow. It's an archaic word. The speaker is struck by the very existence of the Lamb, by the very identity of the Lamb, by the very nature of the Lamb, by the very life of the Lamb. Look at the Lamb, so sweet, so meek, so gentle, so innocent. And look at the sort of life that the Lamb leads, so peaceful, so contented, gave thee life and bid thee feed by the stream and over the mead. It seems to the speaker to act as a foil, to act as a contrast to the life of the human being, to the existence of the human being, full of stress and strain, full of turbulence, full of turmoil, full of tension. And the human being, of course, is far from being naive, far from being innocent, far from being meek. Without saying anything, by just posing these, que these questions, the speaker works out a very subtle contrast between the lamb and himself, between the life of the lamb and the life of the human being. I am reminded of Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. I repeat, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The word bid is used here in the archaic sense of to ask someone to do something. Bid thee feed. God asks the lamb to feed. The point that the poet wants to make is that the lamb knows how to look after itself because it has the guidance of God. Gave thee clothing of delight, softest clothing, woolly bright. Not only does God guide the lamb to look after itself, God has also given the lamb clothing, delightful clothing. Human beings, men have to go to shops and buy clothing for themselves. The lamb which does not have money, the lamb which cannot go to a shop, the lamb which can, cannot order clothing, is provided with clothing by God. And what kind of clothing is it? 
gave thee clothing of delight, delightful. You must remember that the context is England, where the summer temperatures are 10 or 15 degrees. Gave thee clothing of delight, delightful clothing, softest clothing, woolly, bright, made of wool. Expensive clothing. God has provided lamp, the lamp with delightful clothing, with expensive clothing, woolly clothing. Woolly here means made of wool. In today's context, woolly can mean confused, vague. I sometimes think that my classes are woolly. All that I can do is to give you a woolly explanation. Gave thee clothing of delight, softest clothing, the most comfortable clothing, the most expensive clothing, woolly, bright, attractive. The clothing is delightful, the clothing is soft, the clothing is made of expensive wool, and it is bright, it is attractive. These are lines written by a poet. Obviously, lines written by a poet who had memorized the Bible as a child. Profoundly familiar with the philosophy of the Bible. For whom the Bible is not merely a book, but the guiding light of his life. I feel like quoting, I feel like quoting one of my favorite passages from the Bible, Matthew 6.26, Matthew 6.26, Behold the fowls of the air. That's how it begins. There are different versions. Behold the fowls of the air. Look at the birds of the sky. Look at the birds of the sky. They sow not. They reap not. And they gather not into barns. I repeat. Look at the birds of the sky. They sow not. They reap not, and they gather not into barns. Gave thee such a tender voice, making all the veils rejoice. Tender. Tender means kind, loving, caring, affectionate, sweet. Gave thee such a tender voice, making all the veils rejoice. Veils are valleys. Look at the voice of the lamb. It is so sweet, so tender, so caring, so representative of kindness, and it spreads joy through all the valleys. As I have already said, the sheep was, the lamb was, an integral part of the English country scene. And one could constantly hear the bleating of the lamb the bleating of the sheep in the countryside. And the bleat of the lamb characteristically is a weak, wavering cry, very much in keeping with 
the character, the nature, the identity of the animal. Little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know? Who made thee? The poet poses a very important, a very fundamental question to the lamb. Does the lamb know who made it? I think it's more, more of a rhetorical question. A rhetorical question is a statement put in the form of a question. A rhetorical question is not posed for getting an answer. A rhetorical question is given the shape of a question in order to create a greater impact on the hearer or on the reader. As the poem progresses, the poet will explain who made the lamb. The poet knows who made the lamb. And in order to prepare the reader for the explanation, in order to prepare the reader better for the explanation, he poses this rhetorical question to the lamb. Little lamb, who made thee? Dost thou know who made thee? Who made the lamb? And then he asks the lamb, Do you know who made you? Little lamb, I'll tell thee. Little lamb, I'll tell thee. This is an attempt to prepare the reader further for the great answer. Instead of just blotting out the fact who made the lamb, the speaker, the poet, takes a number of preparatory steps. He poses the question, who made the lamb? Then he asks the lamb itself, who made the lamb? And then he says, little lamb, I'll tell thee, little lamb, I'll tell thee. The whole exercise is to heighten the significance of the answer, heighten the impact of the answer on the reader. Instead of straight away declaring who, stating who made the lamb, the poet compels the reader to go on a rather long journey towards the answer so that the answer would have a much more effective impact on the reader. This experience is comparable to the experience, to the experience of going on a pilgrimage. The long pilgrimage heightens the impact of the visit to the holy shrine. He is called by thy name, for he calls himself a lamb. In the Bible, Jesus is the lamb of God. For example, in John 1, 29, John the Baptist sees Jesus coming and John the Baptist exclaims, Behold the Lamb of God. Similarly, in Isaiah 53, 7 and Isaiah 53, 12, Jesus 
is prophesied as the Lamb of God. There is the sacrifice of the Lamb in the Jewish festival of Passover. God provides a Lamb for sacrifice. In the Old Testament story of Abraham and Isaac, the Israelites saw the Lamb as a pure creature, a creature free from all blemishes. Throughout the Old Testament and throughout the New Testament, the Lamb is presented as a special, dedicated animal. God the Father sends God the Son to this world so that he can be sacrificed in order to save the human race from sin. Thus, Jesus is the Lamb of God and the Lamb of sacrifice. He is meek and he is mild. He became a little child. Meek and mild mean in this context more or less the same thing. Gentle, patient, humble, not easily provoked, ready to submit. One of the most famous passages in the Bible goes, I quote, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth, unquote. Matthew 5, 5. Those who forgo worldly power will be rewarded in the kingdom of heaven. This is one of the most important, one of the crucial teachings of Jesus. Not to pursue power not to display strength, not to resist, but to submit. Meekness, mildness, gentleness, patience, the willingness to submit, the willingness to suffer, the refusal to be provoked. These were the values that Jesus Christ, he became a little child. Jesus identified himself with children. And there was something childlike about him, even the Jesus at the point of crucifixion. There was something very childlike about him. His innocence, his honesty, his straightforwardness, his simplicity. And there are several references in the New Testament to Jesus and children. To Jesus praising children. To Jesus exhorting his followers to be like children, to Jesus expressing his love for children, to Jesus blessing children individually, to Jesus demonstrating that he cared for children. You have Luke 18, 16, 18, 16 which says, 
the kingdom of God belongs to children. The values that Jesus prized and Jesus taught were the, were the values characteristically associated with children. And above all, you must remember that Jesus is God the Son. And as God the Son, he is always a little child in the eyes of his Father, in the eyes of God the Father. Thus the poet has succeeded in establishing common ground, interlinking the Lamb, the Child and Jesus. The poet is able to see a sort of identification, interlinking, interconnecting these three. And you must remember that in Christian iconography, Jesus was frequently represented as holding a lamb or placing his hand on the shoulder of a child standing close to him. I a child and thou a lamb, we are called by his name. The thematic trajectory of the poem climbs one step higher and the poet tries to work out a forceful conflation of three things, himself, a child, the lamb and Jesus. The poet calls him a himself, the poet calls himself a child. It is quite possible to believe that the poem is written by a child. So simple is its diction, so sweet, so innocent are the ideas in the poem. But I am not very sure whether Blake wrote it when he was a child. The Lamb was first published in Songs of Innocence in 1789. And Blake and William Blake was 32 years old then. I think it's reasonable to suppose that he did not write the poem when he was a child. He wrote it when he was a young man. If that is the case, why does the poet say, I a child? Because Blake saw himself as a child. Blake had all the characteristics of a child. He was childlike. He was guileless. He was innocent. He was simple. He was meek. He was mild. He had all those qualities for which Jesus in the Bible praises children. He was a mystic and it was quite possible for him to believe that he was a child. I a child and thou a lamb. So you have the child, the, the poet who is a child, either literally or metaphorically, on the one hand, and you have the lamb. There is such a lot in common between the child and the lamb. And finally, you have Jesus. We are called by his name. 
What a strong conflation, uniting the author who is a child, the lamb and Jesus. Little lamb, God bless thee. Little lamb, God bless thee. The poem concludes with a speaker invoking the blessing of God on the lamb, on the little lamb as he calls it. The speaker prays that God may bless the little lamb. The poem has a sort of split thematics. On the one hand, the speaker is a child. He sees the lamb. He is struck with wonder on seeing the lamb. It appears to him to be a marvelous creature. And he talks to the lamb. You must remember that the speaker is an innocent child. He is no Bible scholar. But out of an inborn intuition, he is profoundly aware, he is profoundly aware of the great biblical truths. That is why he says that an identification can be worked out between God, God the Son, and the Lamb. At the same time, it can be argued that the speaker is not a child but an adult. As I have already pointed out, William Blake was a young man when he wrote the poem. However, using his mystic power, the speaker, an adult, identifies himself with the persona of the child. In real life, William Blake prized honesty, truth, lack of guile, compassion, love, service. In, in real life, William Blake was a passionate devotee of Jesus Christ. And probably in a mystic trance, the speaker, though an adult, feels that he is childlike, feels that he is a child. If we accept the second reading, We are able to marvel at the profound biblical knowledge that the speaker displays. There is no doubt that the speaker is a great mystic, a great philosopher, a great Bible scholar, a great man of wisdom. Be that as it may, the speaker in the Lamb is very confident, is very sure of himself, unlike the speaker in the Tiger of William Blake. The speaker in the Tiger has questions but not 
answers. For example, in the penultimate stanza of the tiger, the speaker asks, Did he who made the lamb make thee? The speaker is baffled. The speaker is puzzled. He has no answer for the question. On the other hand, the speaker in the lamb has not only questions but also answers. He knows the questions. He also knows the answers. And he is very sure that the answers are correct. What are the themes dealt with in the Lamb? First of all, there is the theme of God. Not God in a general sense, but a specifically Christian God. God the Creator. God the Creator who created the entire universe, including the Lamb. There is also God the Son, who is alluded to very clearly in the poem. For God the Son, Jesus Christ, is the Lamb of God. Then there is the relationship between God and His creations. How God looks after the Lamb. How God guides the Lamb. How God bids the Lamb do what it must do is a powerful exemplification for us. There is the very clear message characteristically rooted in the Holy Bible that we must believe in God. We must trust in God. We must blindly follow the dictates of God. There is absolutely nothing to worry. He who surrenders completely, surrenders himself completely into the hands of God will be always and in all in all ways always and in all ways protected by God. Look at the birds of the sky. They sow not. They reap not. And they gather not into barns. An important theme dealt with in the poem is nature. We say that Wordsworth is a nature poet. Why not we say the same thing about Blake as well? In the first answer of the poem, we get evocative pictures of the English countryside with its, with its streams its meadows, its valleys, 
the English countryside of which the lamb with its soft clothing, bright clothing, woolly clothing, tender voice is such an integral part. Then there is the theme of childhood. The speaker is a child. If he is not a child, if he is an adult, he uses his mystic powers to see himself as a child. He identifies com himself completely with the child in him. And you must remember that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and thus the child of God. Jesus is also the child of Mary and Joseph. There are numerous passages in the Bible which demonstrate the love the care, the affection, the admiration that Jesus displayed towards children. There is the theme of Christian values, especially the values of innocence, meekness, sacrifice and you must remember that all these values were personified are personified in Jesus Christ that is why Jesus Christ is called to use the Latin term Agnus Dei Agnus Dei, the Lamb of God. It is possible to provide the poem with an eco-critical reading. The poem emphasizes the profound connection between man and nature, between man and the other creatures of the world. Personally, I feel that this is a poem which is ideally suited for carrying out an eco-critical analysis. Let us carry out a survey of the stylistic component of the poem. The poem has a very appropriate title. We have already discussed the title of the poem in some detail. I would like to point out that it's a very simple title, The Lamb, a typical Blake title. But when you come to reflect on the title, you realize that it is not as simple as it appears to be. On the face of it, it's a very simple title. There could not have been a more simple title. But the lamb in the title of the poem is much more than a mere lamb. It is of course an animal. But it is an animal loaded with semantic significance loaded with cultural wealth. We must try to understand what the lamb means in the context in which it is located. How the Israelites saw the lamb. How the Lamb is represented in the Old Testament. 
how the lamb is spoken of in the new testament how christ jesus christ is a lamb of god how la how the lamb is a vehicle for profound symbolism and then we realize that the so called simple title is not so simple after all the title suits the poem excellently the title fits the body of the poem excellently the poem consists of 20 lines it is organized in two stanzas of 10 lines each the rhyme scheme used is a a b b c c d d e e the poem makes use of the meter called trochi in trochi every foot consists of two syllables the first syllable is long or stressed and the second syllable is short or unstressed we come across assonances in the poem assonances is the repetition of a vowel sound an example of this is line 4 which goes by the stream and over the mead we also come across alliteration alliteration is the repetition of a consonantal sound take the first two lines of the second stanza for example little lamb i'll tell thee enjambment literally means striding over enjambment is the smooth and swift movement of sound and sense from one line to the next or from one stanza to the next without a pause characteristically at the end of an enjam line there is no punctuation mark the poet makes use of enjambment in line 2 and line 3 does thou know who made thee gave thee life and bid thee feed the poem is filled with images which are sharp and memorable we have images from rural england evocative images of idyllic rural england memorable images of streams meadows valleys we have animal imagery the lamb is a thickly elusive poem most of the elusions are biblical in nature william blake was a bible scholar he was profoundly familiar with the holy bible and we meet with numerous biblical allusions in the lamb there are allusions to the old testament to the sacrifice of the lamb during the Jewish festival of Passover for example there are allusions to the new testament to the incident in which John the Baptist exclaims on seeing Jesus behold the lamb of god for example there are allusions to the 
numerous famous passages of the canonical books of the New Testament, such as the passage which goes, Behold the fowls of the air, they sow not, they reap not, and they gather not into barns. It is said of Jesus that he never spoke except through parables. I think we can say of William Blake that he never spoke except through symbols. The lamb is rich in its symbolism. For example, the lamb which stands at the center of the thematic structure of the poem is a creature, is an animal, but it is also a symbol. It symbolizes the, the values of Christianity, the Christian values. Meekness, mildness, innocence, purity. It symbolizes nature. It symbolizes, above all, Jesus Christ, who is described in the Bible as the Lamb of God. Blake was keenly aware of the power of repetition and he does make use of repetition in the poem. For example, the last two lines of the poem. The penultimate line is repeated as the last line. Little Lamb, God bless thee. Perhaps the most remarkable thing about the poem is its diction. We always praise Wordsworth for a simple diction. Why not praise Blake for the same? The diction of the Lamb is very simple and very sweet. I don't think there's a single word in the poem which a child cannot understand. It is quite natural that the Lamb is a very popular poem among children. I think we can wrap up the discussion by saying that the two iconic animals of romantic poetry are the lamb and the tiger of William Blake, just as the two iconic birds of romantic poetry are the nightingale of John Keats and the skylark of P.B. Shelley.